Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel record of Mark. The Gospel record of Mark in chapter number 14. The Gospel record of Mark in chapter number 14. We're following Jesus Christ's earthly ministry through these last couple chapters of the Gospel record of Mark. We're in the last week, which is often called the Passion Week of Jesus Christ. And we've already seen as Jesus Christ has spent his last supper with the disciples and has given them some instruction. And we can see now as he's hours away from the cross that he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he begins to pray with his disciples. And so if you wouldn't mind, notice with me in the Gospel record of Mark in chapter number 14. The Gospel record of Mark chapter 14. And notice with me starting at verse number 32. The Gospel record of Mark chapter number 14. Starting at verse 32, the word of God says this. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he came and findeth them sleeping and saith, Unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou, couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. And immediately while he spake cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayeth him had given him a token, saying, Whosoever I shall kiss, the same as he, take him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, and kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and ye took me not. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And they forsook all and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young man laid a hold on him. And he lay, left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the gospel record of Mark chapter 14, the gospel record of Mark chapter 14. And notice with me in verse number 32, the name of the garden where they are at is called Gethsemane. 
Gethsemane. And with this, we want to uh, preach about the things that happen here at the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you now, we're asking that you would teach us more about this manner of praying. Teach us more about the principles of why you thought it was so important to have your disciples pray. And why you had them pray even more when they wanted to go to sleep. Help us to learn the principles here that we can apply it to our own life and see how important it is to pray. With all of this going on, Lord, I recognize that I need you. We need you in a special way. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help us once again to trust by faith that your word can do its own work with your power. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to this event, we can see that everything is leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He's already spent some time with his disciples and he's already warned Judas that he knew what Judas was going to do. But Judas left anyways. And as the other 11 is left with him, he, they observe the Lord's Supper. He's taken some time to give them some instruction. He's even watched Peter say, I will never deny you. And that was just a matter of hours ago. And now we come to this time. It's in the middle of the night. <laughs> we could see that there's a calmness in the air, almost an anticipation of what is yet to come. And the very first thing I want to show you here is Jesus' prayers. Jesus' prayers. Do you know that in the Bible, in the gospel records, there are 12 recorded prayers of Jesus? Now, we know that he prayed often, and the Bible talks about that, but there's only 12 times that it actually records Jesus praying. Can you imagine how amazing that would be to hear the Son talk to his Father? To hear God talk to God? To hear what it'd be like. And these disciples have a privilege like no one else. To be nestled right up to Jesus. And to hear him pray to his father. So Jesus has gathered his disciples. And they've walked from Jerusalem. Down a valley and up a little mountains called the mountains of Olivet. Uh. There in the mountains of Olivet is a certain place that is called the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Jesus in the middle of the night has gone outside <laughs> the open sky. They're not in a gazebo. They're not in a building. They're out in the open sky in the middle of the night. No lights, no street lights, but just them. And they begin to pray. Notice if you don't mind as we pick it up what happens in verse number 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while I pray. So they get to the garden and Jesus is going to go up further. And he tells his disciples, you guys, you guys stay here. I'll be back. I need to go talk to the Lord. Then he says, before we go, you, you and you, Peter, James and John, I want you guys to come with me. So notice verse 33. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and notice this, and began to be sore amazed. Who's to be sore amazed? This was <coughs> Jesus. He was sore amazed. And to be very heavy. The word heavy here carries the idea of being weighted down with a burden. Um, so Jesus here, he's got a burden. He wants to pray. I want you to think about this during this time. The disciples have no clue what's about to happen. But Jesus, who knows everything, knows that he's going to the cross in a matter of hours. The disciples don't know this. They don't realize the importance of this time. To them, they're just tired. And Jesus is asking them to pull in another job. By the way, as a little side note, being a disciple of Christ is not a nine to five job. Here they are, one o'clock in the morning. And Jesus says, no, can't go to sleep yet, boys. We got business of praying. And so they're in the garden, they're praying. He grabs Peter, James, and John. Jesus has got a burden. He's got a heavy burden. And he says, boys, pray. Notice in verse 34. 
And he saith to them. Now imagine the disciples are down further. He's just got Peter, James, and John. He's not praying yet, but he looks to them and he says something significant. Verse 34, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry here and watch. He actually tells the disciples, I'm so broken hearted. I'm so burdened that I could almost die right now. That's how much of a burden that Jesus had. And he's just being honest with his disciples. There's a weight on me. There's a burden on me. And I'm telling you boys, this is important. I am weighted down. I'm almost ready to die right now. I'm so broken hearted. What's breaking his heart? The sins of the world. That's why he's going to die. He's already starting to feel the pressure that in a few hours, he is actually going to pay for every individual sin of the world. And this is a heavy responsibility. This is a big burden to pay for every sin's you know, there may be some times that you're brokenhearted of your sins. You look at your failures, you look at your mistakes, you look at the consequences of it, and you, feel, you could feel a burden. Multiply that to billions and billions and billions. This is the weight that he had on him. The burden of the sins and the consequences of the sin. And you know what Jesus did when he had the burden? He prayed. He said, I have to pray. And may I remind you and put to your attention that if the Son of God went to the Lord in prayer when he had a heavy burden, shouldn't we do the same thing? Shouldn't that be where we run to when we have this burden? So he tells the disciples, tarry here. Boys, you guys wait here. So they left the, the rest of the disciples down the mountain. He brings Peter and James and John. He stops, says, boys, I'm so broken hearted. I'm trying to let you know that maybe you could understand that you could pray with me. I need your prayers right now because I'm about ready to die. I'm just so broken hearted. I want you to tarry here, wait here and watch. That word watch is an important word and you'll see that throughout this passage here. The word watch carries the idea to fast from sleep. To fast from sleep. Boys, I know that you're tired, but I have a burden. I am so sorrowful. I'm ready to die because I'm so broken hearted. And I, there, tomorrow, it, there's such a thing coming on. You don't even know what's around the corner. But I'm telling you that you need to pray. You need to fast from sleep. I know you're tired, but please, I need your prayers now. Fast from sleep. And let's pray together. And he leaves them and he goes further. The Bible talks about a stone's throw. So it's like if you were to toss a stone. So it's a little bit of ways. And he gets together. He tells the, the three disciples to pray. Hoping that maybe they'd pray together. Do something to keep themselves awake. And he goes by himself a little bit further. Verse 35. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, this is a good time to remind you that even though Jesus Christ was God, he was still 100% man. And I don't know anyone who said, you know what, tomorrow we're going to kill you even though you're innocent. You ready to volunteer? Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to go through the process of dying. Many of us are looking forward to the hope that we have on the other side of death, but we're not looking forward to the death part. Amen. Jesus was still 100% human, and he did not want to die. This is telling us here that he still had that humanity. Now, he didn't sin against it, but it's, it's still good to recognize what your flesh wants. I don't want to die. I know this needs to be done. And this isn't going to be... Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him. He was tortured like no man was. He did not want to die. And he began to pray, Lord, if there, if there was any other way to do this, by the way, there is no other way to have forgiveness of your sins except for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
How do we know that? Because if there was, he wouldn't have died. If you could get to heaven by being a good person, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. If you could get to heaven by paying money to the church, he wouldn't have had to die. If you could get to heaven by somehow uh, weighing out the scales and making it go a little bit further than your bad part, he wouldn't have had to die. He's saying if there was any other way, but there's not. If I could think of any other way to forgive the sins of man. However, for the wages of sin is death. Something must die because of the sin. There's no other way. There's no backup plan. But he says, if it were possible. It's not possible. If it's other possible, I, don't, I would choose not to die. I would choose to put some other plan in place. But there's not. There's not. Verse 36, he continues to pray. And he said, Abba, Father. That word Abba is a term of endearment. We would kind of call it Daddy. Daddy. Papa. Papa. It's a close endearment that usually an adult son would call his father. Daddy. Father. And he began to say, Abba, Father. All things are possible to thee. By the way, this is about the third or fourth time that this is mentioned in the Gospel record of Mark. That with God... All things are possible. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible to thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what thou wilt. He says, Lord, this is what I want, but I die to what I want. I die to my ambitions. I die. He died to self and said, it's all about what you want. It's what you want. I surrender to this. Even Jesus surrendered to his wants and gave it to God. Now, while he's praying this, what he's praying through is the process, not the end result. Do you know God is just as interested in how we get there as he is about the end result? God's interested in the process of it, us, of how we handle the goal. Well, you said, well, I got through that trial. But yeah, how did you get through the trial? Did you get through it kicking and screaming and God just kind of got you to the finish line? Or was it more like, God, I trust you. It may not be what I want, but I trust that you know what's best. It's the spirit that you have going through it. It's how you go through it is just as important to God. The results are up to him anyways. How we do it is important. Jesus would not attempt to face the trials without first spending time with God. Lord, I need you. I'm going to face something big tomorrow. I need you. My flesh does not want to go through it. But I don't want what my flesh wants. I want what you want. Help me. Help me. Again, he's giving us a great example. We're seeing this intimate time in prayer. The time where Jesus was the most burdened. The time where he knows what's about to happen. And he runs to God. That should be the example for all of us. We should run to God. Especially when we know something big is in the horizon. We need to run to God. So we start off with Jesus' prayer. Then we come to the disciples' sleep. The disciples sleep. So Jesus has this big burden on him. He prays and he spends an hour. He's talking with God. Then he gets up. Checks on his disciples. Notice if you don't mind verse 37. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping. Now. I don't know how spiritual you would be. But if you had a big burden. Something big, you're about ready to die because of the burden. And you ask some people to pray and you come back and instead of praying, those bums are sleeping. Aren't you glad Jesus was patient with them? Now, we understand for the disciples, he had a heavy, Jesus had a heavy burden, but the disciples did not understand how great the burden was. They knew something that was troubling Jesus, but they didn't have that same concern. He didn't feel it. For them, they've already had long nights. Jesus works them hard. They've already had a long week, a lot of things going on. And now it's one o'clock in the morning when normal people are sleeping. And they're tired. 
And there's no street lights. And it's been a warm day and the cool breeze is blowing. And you're tired. We'd all fall asleep too. Jesus is the one with the burden. And they don't understand how great this is. How important it is. How pivotal. How all of world history has led to this one event. And they don't realize the significance of it. And they go to sleep. It could have been one of those prayer meetings where someone's praying too long and someone conks out and someone conks out. If you could forgive the personal illustration, but I, we had a prayer meeting uh, when I was an assistant to the pastor and we try to pray for revival. And there was a time that we were praying together and the partner that um, was with us, he was fast asleep. And even when we were done praying, he was still fast asleep. And so to commemorate the event, we got a bunch of crayons. We were in Sunday school rooms and a bunch of crayons and put in his hand and put like a party hat on him and stuff. And they were probably that asleep. They were just gone. I meant sawing logs, Jesus walking up and he could hear Peter just waxing eloquently in this sleep and comes up and <sighs> he comes up and gets him awake and notice with him. Again, he's got a burden on him. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith to Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Peter, I asked you guys to pray. I've got a big day tomorrow. I'm trying to tell you I'm so broken hearted. I need you to pray. This is important. Couldn't you just pray for an hour fast from sleep from an hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Now remember, just a a couple hours ago, Peter said, I'll never betray you. Jesus is saying, you're going to be tested shortly. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. That temptation is going to be there. You need this prayer time, Peter. You are not going to be spiritually strong enough unless you pray. You're not going to be able to do it. He says, the flesh or the spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Peter, you are going to be tempted tomorrow. Tomorrow's the big day and you're not ready. If you haven't spent time in prayer, you will not be ready. If we can underscore that. There are many things that we face that if we were not in prayer, we would not be ready. He says, I need you to be ready. I need you to pray. If you want to, to not deny me, if you, don't, if you want to be able to face the hardships that tomorrow is going to bring, and it's going to be harder than you've ever faced before, Peter, you need this time of prayer. You need this time of prayer. Pray, Peter, pray. I'm telling this for your sake. Pray, pray. And so he went again away. So boys, he woke him up. You can almost see James kind of getting the sleepies out of his eyes and said, I'm glad he's yelling at Peter. Uh, and Peter's kind of trying to wake up. All right, boys, we're going to do it this time. And Jesus goes up, begins to pray. All right. And I don't know how far they made it, but they crashed again. But Jesus went away and prayed and he prayed again. What did he pray? Not my will, but yours, God. I don't want to face this. If there was any other way, but there's no other way. So help me to do what needs to be done tomorrow. I need you. I need you. And he prays for another hour. Now, at this time, another gospel record is, uh, gives us more emphasis. But he is praying so fervently and so heatedly that what is happening is that the capillaries in his skin are bursting. He's so intense. And even though it's a cool evening, the breeze is coming in, he's sweating because he's so intense in praying that the capillaries, the blood that is broken from the capillaries is mixed with a sweat. And the Bible says that he's sweating great drops of blood. He's praying so intently, which again, the disciples are so tired that they're not noticing, hey, our master is bleeding all over the place. But Jesus is praying. This is one of the most important times of prayer in all of human history. Think about this. That if Jesus didn't pray as he ought, he would have said, forget you guys, I'm getting off the cross. Amen. And you know what? He would have been justified for doing so because he didn't have to pay our price. He chose to pay our price. But if he did that, we would have all been doomed to hell. 
he's recognizing, I'm not even going to trust my flesh. I'm not going to trust. I need to die to self and depend on God's spirit. So I am not tempted to be weak. This is an important time. May I say that this is the most important prayer of all of human history. And the disciples aren't understanding how important this prayer time is. But he is praying. And he's getting a hold of God and saying, God, not what I want. I don't want to die, but it's not what I want. It's what you want. This is what needs to happen. Give me the strength. Give me your grace. Give me this. Lord, I need, in order to do what needs to be done, it can't be dependent on me. Because I'm afraid my flesh will say no. We've been there many times. When our flesh said no. And we knew better. But we just couldn't convince our flesh to do what was right. We should have prayed. We should have prayed. So he comes back the third time, verse number 40. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer them. I mean, what do you, what do you say when Jesus wakes you up again? Why are you sleeping? tired? I mean, what do you say to him when he's trying to say, this is important, guys. You need to be praying. You need to be praying. Why can't you just fast from sleep from an hour and just pray with me? You've got to pray. I don't know. They just didn't say anything. Well, what, do, what do you tell God why you failed? And he cometh again a third time and saith to them, sleep on now. Take your rest. The time for prayer is over. It's done. Not more you could do about it. Opportunity is gone. By the way, that does remind us that we don't have eternal opportunity to pray. There are some things that are requiring our prayers now, and if we miss it, we've missed it. We missed that opportunity. We missed that window that was open for someone's heart to be softened. That time for that person to be receptive. He says, sleep on now and take your rest. Now, they're not going to go to sleep, but he's saying the prayer time is over. You might as well forget trying to force yourself to stay up for to pray now. It's over. It is enough. The hour has come, and behold, the man, Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up and let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. Now, interesting enough that where they're standing on the Garden of Gethsemane, you could see from... Jerusalem, and you can see the valley that comes in between them. And what's happening now is that Judas is le leading the charge of a lot of the, the temple guards. And so Jesus, as he's finishing praying, can watch the line of torches coming from Jerusalem up the mountain, and he can see that they're coming. He sees them there. The disciples have missed it. They don't see him sweating great, great drops of blood. They just don't notice what's going on. Which comes to this last thing here. The master's betrayal. The master's betrayal. 43. And immediately while he yet spoke. So he's waking up the disciples. Hey, he's here. Get up. <laughs> he's been watching them for a while come by. You can imagine how intense your prayers would be now. As you're watching them coming. It's, it's here. Praying more. Lord, you've got to give me grace. I, he could have just, with a word, just killed them all as they were coming up the mountain and said, forget this. He could have just caused a big earthquake and swallowed them up like Korah and Moses. But he watched them coming and watching that time clock run down. Lord, you've got to give me help. It's here. It's now. They're coming for me. I need you now. And now they've come up. They're there. And immediately why he spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude. There is more than just a couple there. I mean, they're so afraid of Jesus, they brought an entire army to come get him. With swords and staves from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. And he that betrayed him gave them a token saying, Whosoever I shall kiss... This, uh, that same, take him and lead him away safely. Now, 
at least he's still trying to look out for Jesus. Take him away safely. Don't, don't hurt him. But I want you to think about this. Jesus is praying all night and he's been sweating great drops of blood. When Judas came and kissed him, his lips touched that precious blood that could have saved him and forgiven him all of his sins. He actually had on his body physically the soul-saving blood of the Lamb. And he never took it for himself. It was on, but it was never applied. Notice, if you don't mind, verse 45, And as soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and saith, Master, Master. That word master is teacher, teacher. Master, you're the boss, my Lord. Imagine him calling him my teacher, my master, my Lord. And kissing him and say, haul him away. He betrayed him. And they took their hands on him and took him. So this army came and immediately surrounded Jesus and took him. And one of them, we know from another gospel record that this is Peter. May I remind you here that John Mark is writing from the perspective of Peter. And so Peter is probably saying to John Mark, let's not put any attention on me. The other gospel records take care of this, that Peter's the one that drew the sword. And smote the sword of, uh, servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. The person's name is Malchus. So Peter said, listen here, you're not going to take him. And he slices off the ear. Some people speculated that he was gunning for his neck and missed or whatever. But he did. And Jesus in another gospel record take the ear and he put it on and healed it instantly. And tell Peter put it away. This is what needs to happen. Peter thought he was doing the Lord a favor. But that's not what the Lord needed at this time. You know what he did need? He needed Peter to pray earlier. That's when Peter was needed. He didn't need him to respond from emotions. He did not need him. By the way, this is part of that temptation. Peter could have said, I'm trusting Jesus and took his cue from Jesus by allowing them to take him. And said, I don't know what's going on, but I could trust Jesus. But instead, he reacted emotionally and lashed out at someone thinking he was doing God a favor and he was not. In verse 48, and Jesus answered and said, are you come out against a thief or as against a thief with swords and staves to take me? Now, he puts in a good point. He says, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you took me not, but the scripture must be fulfilled. He looks at him and looks at this big army with pitchforks, with swords, with staves, with torches, and they come and surround him at two, three, four o'clock in the morning. In the middle of the night, they come with this big army. And he says, what? Am I like a runaway criminal? Am I a thief? Did you go do a mid manhunt? You knew where to find me. I was, te I was just at the temple teaching. Why didn't you take me there in the daylight in front of everyone? But you came in the middle of the night with this big army for just me. He says, nevertheless, it needs to be what's done. You'd almost sent some... Uh, I don't want to say that Jesus was in the flesh, but it is kind of a thing of, hey, uh, why did you wait to this? Why was it that this was your opportune time? You could have had me at any time you wanted, but you had to come in the middle of the night. You have to treat me like a criminal. Now, by the way, this is going to be beginning of what they're going to do uh, horribly wrong and illegally. We're going to cover tonight his illegal trial. and We're going to go through all the different reasons why it was illegal. And so Jesus was not put through a proper channel, wasn't arrested properly. Everything is going to be illegal because there's no way they could have got away with it if it was above board, including this arrest right here in the middle of the night where no one could protest. None of the crowd could get in the way. No one could defend Jesus. What are the 12 disciples going to do against an army of people that are armed and ready to go? And Jesus said, all right. And they begin. Notice in verse 50. And they all forsook him and fled. All the disciples they took off. As the army arrests Jesus, they ran for their lives. Jesus is taken and they took off. 
Verse 51 sounds like a strange verse. And there followed him a certain young man having linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid a hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Many people believe that this is John Mark himself. That the writer of the gospel record of Mark, as a young man, he's out and he wants to see what's going on. He maybe he heard in the middle of the night that Jesus and his disciples of the Garden of Gethsemane. And so he took off from his mother's house. He's probably a teenager at this time. And he comes out and he's watching all of this. And he watches with his own eyes as Jesus is arrested and sees the disciples start fleeting. And as the disciples run, they see this young man who's, who's kind of wrapped up in a cloth. And they said, let's get out of here, man. And they take him. And he ends up leaving the cloth behind as they're dragging him away from the scene. Everyone left him. Jesus is abandoned. And now the most horrible thing in all of history comes. The disciples fled. Now with this, we have a somber story. A heartbreaking story. But yet, God has given it to us here to teach us some things about prayer. And I want to record for you really quickly four truths we learn about prayer from this passage. Four truths learned about prayer. These are going to be a help to you. First of all, prayer gives strength that is available for the will of God. Prayer gives strength that is available for the will of God. If it's God's will, God will give you the strength to do it. Where do I get the strength to do God's will? By praying. By asking God, help me to do your will. There may be something that you say, I have a hard time doing. If you ask God, He will help you. Maybe there's someone that says, you know, I try to read my Bible. I want to read my Bible. But every time I read my Bible, my eyes get heavy and I feel like the disciples. And shh. Do you know that God wants you to read your Bible? And if he wants you to read your Bible, you can say, God, can you help me? And he will. Maybe there's a child that's saying, I do horrible on tests. I get tests and I freak out. Do you know that if you pray and say, God, can you help me? He will help you. Prayer can give you grace. Maybe you could feel the frustration. Things are starting to go up there, but you know you still got to get things done. Lord, I need help. I can't do this. Prayer gives strength that is available to do God's will. That is available for the will of God. Something else that we see and learn about this passage about prayer is that prayer allows us to deal with the weakness of other believers. Prayer allows us to deal with the weakness of fellow believers. People will fail you. Guarantee. Unfortunately, there may be a time that I may fail you. That's why you need to keep your eyes on the Lord and not put me on a pedestal. I don't want God to knock me off a pedestal to teach you a lesson. People will fail you. How do you put up with people who fail over and over and over? Prayer. Prayer. It helps you to deal with people correctly. I mean, Jesus, when he gets through, he's watching the disciples sleeping. If any of us at 1, 2 in the morning are asked someone to do something and they're not awake and they're not understanding this, we'd probably snap on them, yell at them. Come on, you bum! Jesus was firm, but he was patient with them. Trying to say, boys, you don't understand how important this is. We have people that fail all the time around us. And usually the closer they are to us, the less tolerant we are with their failures. How do we deal with that? Prayer. Prayer helps us to be able to deal with other believers' weaknesses. When they're not measuring up, when they fail, it helps us to be able to patiently deal with them. Even when Peter took the ear off of Malchus. Jesus was able to deal with Peter and his failure. Something else we learn about prayer here is that prayer helps us to handle the wicked. Prayer helps us to handle the wicked. Just because the wicked is wicked does not give us the right to respond incorrectly. 
How do we respond correctly to someone who wants to do us harm? And by the way, they wanted to do Jesus harm. Why didn't Jesus just send a lightning bolt to strike uh, Judas dead after he kissed him and betrayed him? Because Jesus was patient with the wicked. Still giving him an opportunity. Still loving on him. Prayer does that. We have a wicked world around us who's against us. How do we deal with them? Prayer. Prayer. Otherwise, we'll respond in the flesh and that's not the answer. We make things worse. There's another thing, a lesson that we learn about prayer from this incident, is that prayer helps us to be more mature, uh, bring, prayer helps bring a more mature view of the work of God. Prayer helps us to bring a more mature view of the work of God. Not my will, but thine. You know, we can have the immature view that says, I don't want to do this, so I'm not. Jesus did not want to go to the cross, neither would anyone else. But he was able to look past his wants and say, what does God want? What does God want? Prayer brings us to that place. You can't work that up yourself. It's prayer. Someone who says, I don't care. I'm not going to read my Bible. I don't want to. Is someone who hasn't been in prayer. Someone who says, I'm not going to pass out any track. Someone who hasn't been in prayer. Prayer brings us to the place where we're saying, God, not what I want, but whatever you want. If you want this done, you can give me the strength to get it done. It may not be what I want to do, but what you want. Jesus is probably engaged right now the most important prayer time in all of history. And because it's the most important prayer time, it's a type of prayer time that we should take time to view. What can we learn about prayer? Why is this such an important time? Because it teaches us so much about how important prayer is. And if it was so important that hours... Jesus could have slept. Wouldn't that be a normal response? I got a busy day tomorrow. They're going to kill me. I might as well get a good night's sleep. But instead of getting a good night's sleep, he said, Lord, I need you. By the way, he was able to respond better to all of the illegal things going on with a lack of sleep and lots of prayer than what he would have if he had a full night's sleep and no prayer. It was the prayer that made the difference. He said, come tonight, and as we list out all the illegal things in the trial, if you were in your flesh, you wouldn't be able to stand it. How could he do it? This time of prayer was so pivotal. Why did he stay on the cross when he didn't have to, when he was innocent? Because of this prayer time right before. We cannot underscore how important prayer is. Now, if we can't underscore the importance of how important prayer is, why do we have such a lack of prayer? Why is it that we don't pray more? Why is it that we're missing out on this important principle here. Why don't we pray more? You know how many of your trials would have been completed successfully and victorious, victoriously as if we prayed? How many times we have interactions with loved ones that went horribly that wouldn't have been so horrible if we took the time to pray? How many times that we went through unexpected things in our day and we didn't respond properly because we didn't pray before the unexpected happened? We need to have this time of prayer. We need to pray more and more. Do you know that prayer is the only thing in the Bible that the Bible commands us to do without ceasing? Bible reading is important, but it doesn't say to read your Bible without ceasing. Soul winning is important, but the Bible say, doesn't say to go soul winning without it. Important. Church is important, but it doesn't say that we're supposed to be in church day and night 24-7. But it does say to pray without ceasing. And yet, we pray so little. 
And we wonder why we don't have the power. We don't have the victory. It's because we failed to pray. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come and we explore this most important part, time of human history, this most important period of prayer, we can learn many principles that we need to apply to ourselves, and we just come to the solution, come to the conclusion, we need to pray more. Lord, forgive me for my prayerlessness. Just be honest with you, Lord. I know better, and yet I still have a hard time praying as I ought. I'm thankful that you could give grace and that you're even giving us a loving warning to remind us how important prayer is. We know with God all things are possible, but they're only possible as we pray. Help us to be known as a people of prayer. Help this church to be known as a place of prayer. Help us to be a type of people that said it wasn't us, it was God. That we have a God that hears and answers prayer. Maybe God has given us a warning about what we're going to face in the next couple days. And he's trying to say, you need to pray, you need to pray. You don't understand what you're going to face. You cannot survive it if you don't pray. Maybe there's a request that you've just been putting off. Maybe you find that your flesh has so much power and your spirit is so weak. It's because of our lack of prayer. Maybe there's something specific that God is drawing you. Maybe there's an idea that you said, I don't know how to pray. Maybe you just need to come to God and say, God, teach me. You know, we would love to teach you how to do a prayer journal. We'd love to teach you about spending time in prayer. Maybe you just need to block off some time and say, Lord, this is my prayer time. This is when I pray. But whatever it is that God's drawing you, we're asking, Lord, that you would give them victory. Give them grace. Give them the courage and bravery to respond to you. And that we would be a people of prayer. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus. And I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.